be at the top of the mountains. See, Spain, Spain was neutral. And the neutral quality made that usable for our boys to try to get back. They were directed to travel to a small town, and they did. Ultimately, what was the next one? After arriving there, they were arrested by Spanish soldiers and were sent by bus to Barcelona to prison. Now, that would kind of shake you up, but they had been told about that. The Spanish authorities had to do that to look good. And once they were there, then what happened next? After eight days, they were sent by train to Madrid to the American Embassy where they were formally identified as who they really were. By this time, folks, there were no more walking. They were either in bus or trains. And they, they felt like, my gosh, we made it. My gosh, we made it. And as they, as they thought back, and they dared not even think back of that long trip, mind you, mind you, it went down on February the 8th, 1943, and he was missing in action six months and 12 days. And everybody back home assumed he was dead, and rightfully so. When an 8th Air Force bomber went down, and the authorities knew nothing and could tell you nothing, and because the fatality rate was so enormous, everybody back home gave up. But six months and 12 days, a very strong and young 18-year-old boy, who was a man if ever there was one, waited at Gibraltar for that airplane from the Air Corps to come get him. And within, you know, oh, it's comparatively the blink of an eye, like an hour or so later, he was at his base in England. He boarded a plane and flown back to England. He was sent to Eisenhower's headquarters where he was reissued, reissued military identification and relieved of further combat duties. I want to tell you about combat duties. While he was at that farmhouse and getting nurse back to health and, and eating, at one point he, he, they found this long-legged rooster. And since he was from Kentucky, even before Kentucky fried chicken, any Kentuckian ought to be able to cook a rooster. Well, he's made a lot of talks in school rooms since, since you know, the last few years. And school kids get really wide-eyed when he talks about chicken feather soup. Can you imagine that? I won't be hungry for a day or two just thinking about it. But anyway, also before he left back there, as you can well imagine, he knew that the rest of his life, he would love each and every member of that household. And I mean with an affection that's, that's hard to even grasp because think of what they did for him. Think of the difference they made and the kindly treatment. I mean, when he describes their treatment of him, you just sit there in awe of how nice and good they were to him. Anyway, while he was there, hard, well, hardly a day went by when he'd have to go outside. They won't be seen too much. We look up. And there they'd be, hundreds of B-17s on their way in. On their way in, the contrails in the sky at about 35,000 feet. All the crew with oxygen masks at their faces. All the gunners at the high readiness. The pilot at the controls concentrating as infinitely possible to concentrate. Thinking every thought and determined, he considered all other nine crewmen his responsibility. And he considered that airplane his responsibility. And not only was he going to take care of that airplane as best he could, but he wasn't going to let anything happen to that crew, not any member of it. So he knew all this as they're flying over. He knew how that's what they all felt. He also knew that unlike in the movie Memphis Bell, there wasn't any goofing off on that airplane. They were talking on intercom about this and that, which was utter foolishness like in the movie. 
He says there was hardly ever a sound on the train. They didn't talk on the intercom because the intercom was extremely important. Oh, well, sure. Three o'clock coming in, three o'clock coming in. That's when you'd hear them. That sort of thing. But that was the only conversation, and he knew that. I said, Lee, what went through your mind? And he said, and he said, Asa, I just knew the danger they were flying into, and I felt so badly for them, each and every one of them. I knew what they were thinking and what they were doing as I looked up and watched them. But I got to tell you, I was just glad I was on the ground. <laughs> you can imagine. So he gets to Eisenhower's headquarters, and uh, he was uh, somewhat, he was taken away from Eisenhower's headquarters to another place and debriefed. But then, after he was relieved of combat duty, glad to be so done, he had to wait. He, he was released. You, you're, you go to the United States. But the first place you go, Staff Sergeant Freights, is to Ed, Andrews, er, uh, er, uh, Andrews Field for extensive re debriefing. And we mean the real thing. In the meantime, Staff Sergeant Freights, you do not call anybody. Even if you could call or send word to Kentucky, you do not do it. Well, Lee was a good soldier. If he was told that, he knew they were worried sick, but he did not make any call or try to. How do you get back? All the airplanes are coming this way. Well, oddly enough, and Lee's a brave tempered man. I don't think he ever took a drink in his life, but he's in a saloon waiting, trying to figure out how to get back. And some guy in the saloon, a serviceman, struck up a conversation with him, and he learned that this guy's going back. He said, hey, can I get you like a ride? I want to go back to America. He did. And he went right to Andrews Air Force Base. And the debriefing at that point was deep and thorough. They asked him all about the Germans he saw, and what were they doing? and what equipment they had. And he asked him other things too. And he learned that the reason the 8th Air Force was doing everything it was doing had a very strong purpose. Project Overlord. Normandy Invasion. June 6, 1944. That's what everybody's mind was on. How did they do that? How did they prepare for it? They can tell you, and I'm going to now. They ended up with the most magnificent internal combustion engine in an airplane that ended up being the most fantastic airplane ever made for what it was for. The P-51 Mustang, folks, you've all heard of it. The P-51 Mustang was equipped in its evolution with Rolls-Royce engines and what they call Tokyo gas tanks. They got their name because of long-range bombing had to have a lot of extra gas when you went over to Japan. The P-51s, I've got to get my notes on this because it's just amazing. Excuse me a minute. How are we fixed on time, son? We've got about nine minutes. I can't hear you, your mouth's moving. About nine minutes. About uh, nine minutes or so? Okay. I'm going to lay this down. Don't go away. Let me say, right where you put it, dummy. <laughs> Lee was in the 305 bomb group. The 305 bomb group made 337 missions, bombing runs, daylight. They lost 154 B-17s. That's almost half. Think of that. Isn't that remarkable? Everything I have written here is the result of extensive research. And I've got all my books and things here to show anybody that wants to see it. 
Eighth Air Force deaths were almost as many as the Marine and Navy deaths combined. On just one day in the month of August 1943, 40% of the 8th Air Force was either crippled or had been destroyed. The Mustang hadn't gotten there yet. I told you a while ago, Luftwaffe fighters were so effective at downing B-17s that there were a thousand aces in the Luftwaffe Air Force. So I'm, I'm going to be repetitive, but it doesn't hurt. Hang in there. 75% of the 8th Air Force bomber crews failed to complete their goal of 25 missions. You can see why there wasn't a small talk on an airplane. It was all business, and it didn't matter at least said how many times you went. You were hardened to it, but you were scared, and you knew it could be your last one. During one time span of eight straight days, six straight days, during the month of February 1944, over 2,000 8th Air Force Airmen failed to return to their bases. In March of 1944, on the 6th, we made our first bombing run over Berlin. Hitler's home, Hitler's most protected town. It was lined with that aircraft guns. And there were literally on the airfields 400 Luftwaffe fighters ready to attack our bombers if they ever showed up over Berlin. Well, the boys back that made up their mind about such things said that'll be the most demoralizing thing we could do. So they did. But they had to get rid of those fighter planes. We had bombed the, the places where they were built, but the Germans were smart. They were rebuilding them. <coughs> the only thing we could do was shoot them out of the air, and that's why the P-51 was born. The P-51 was so superior to it even if any 109 was behind him, and he was thinking, I've got him now. The P-51 was so fast and so maneuverable, he would disappear right in front of the guy's eyes on the flip over. And within just seconds, he'd be behind that any 109, shooting him down. <laughs> and then into the fray of the 8th Air Force Mighty P-51 fighter planes, within 45, the first 45 minutes, of the engagement between P-51s and ME-109s, P-51 pilots shot down 150 German fighter planes. P-51s shot down 179 on another raid. But we were sending bombers that didn't have bombs in them to lure the Luftwaffe into the sky. Why? We didn't want them strafing the beaches at Normandy. If we had, if we had had them at full force, the Normandy invasion would not have succeeded. The P-51 literally destroyed over a third of the entire inventory of fighter planes in one week. During one month, P-51s had more Luftwaffe kills than the combined kills of all the years leading up to that month. By June 6, 1944, the Luftwaffe had been so decimated that it posed no problem to the D-Day invasion forces. Folks, I was 15 when the war ended. I was 11 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. I have a memory of these things because I had an inquiring mind and instead of reading the funny paper, I was reading the paper. I knew where everybody was and what was going on. There were 16 million American men and so women too, of course, but basically men at that time. <coughs> 16 million of them were, in, were servicemen. You could go over to the Union Terminal and the khaki was everywhere. You could only walk for it. And all those guys now have gotten older, lots older. But they folks have not just my affection, but my reverence. Dr. Huey in Burma, Staff Sergeant, Staff Surgeon, I meant to say, J.M. Staff, he was a captain. And, and Staff Sergeant Lee Frakes, the gentleman sitting right here, who was that handsome man you saw that was young, who got from where he was to where he needed to be. And at Andrews Air Force Base, after the debriefing, and he was allowed to call home, 
The only number he had was his mother-in-law's. His wife was staying there, but she was working. Of course, all the women were doing what they could for the, for the cause. She answered the phone, and he said, hello, this is Lee. Well, fortunately, a good friend of hers was there with her because she immediately fainted. <laughs> she did. Right, Lee? Immediately fainted. They literally assumed he was dead. He wasn't. He and Patty lived wonderful long lives. He found a great job after he got out of the service. It was Mr. Frakes instead of Staff Sergeant Frakes. They lived for a while at Boone Lake, and now he lives in a wonderful, beautiful home in Walton. It is one of the most respected citizens in the town, and all of us are fortunate to live on the same planet that he does, that he prays. And Hugh Downs was warming up the crowd. And Hugh looked at his watch and said, five minutes to go, if any of you need to. <laughs> Anyhow, if any of you need a break, 